Catherine Pangonis is a historian specialising in the medieval world of the Mediterranean and the Middle East and of the ancient cities that dot the Mediterranean coastline. Names like Tyre, Carthage, Syracuse, Ravenna and Antioch are some of the most oldest and most intriguing. And to bring these mysterious lost capitals to life, Catherine brings the reader on a voyage from the dawn of civilization on the Lebanese coast to the modern day Turkey racked by the devastation of the 2023 earthquake. Combining on the ground research with great storytelling skills, this is a revelatory new study of the story of the Mediterranean and a powerful reflection on the sometimes fleeting glory of empires. And Catherine's going to speak to us this evening for 40, 45 minutes, then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Um, so I'd ask you if you, a question occurs to you to get your hand up so we won't have done that awful minute of silence and where people like me get very nervous. Um, and there are two roving mics, so I would just ask you if you wait to get the microphone into your hand uh, before you start speaking. And it's great welcoming people to Dublin, but it's also great welcoming people to Dublin for the first time. So could you welcome Catherine Mangonis. I'm going to set a timer so I can keep track of this better. Well, anyway, thank, I'm really, really pleased to be here. Uh, as Cormac said, it's my first time in Dublin, but actually I live in Lebanon and my flatmate in Beirut is from Dublin, so I've heard a lot about the city and it's great to be here at last. So thank you so much for having me here and for being interested in my new book, which I'm going to share some information about with you now. As Cormac said, it's about five cities around the coast of the Mediterranean. And it was quite difficult to select which to include because, as I'm sure you all know, the Mediterranean is not short of cities that have amazing, diverse, interesting histories. I mean, the most famous among these are Rome, Alexandria and Athens. But what I wanted to do with this book is try and approach Mediterranean history from a different angle, a less familiar angle, and bring some of these cities that, have, that were once on the same scale, on the same level of importance as Rome, as Athens, but have since declined into relative obscurity. And I wanted to bring these cities to the public eye and introduce them to readers. So, as mentioned, the cities that I focus on are Tyre, which is on the south coast of Lebanon. Well, there's only one coast, but the, the most southern point of the coastline, just above the blue line, the border with Israeli territory. Carthage on the coast of North Africa in modern day Tunisia. Syracuse on the southeast coast of Sicily, very much the center of the Mediterranean, just a little to the east of Carthage. Ravenna in northern Italy and Antioch in southern Turkey on the very it's the southernmost city of import in Turkey it's where the border just dips into Syria and in fact Syria still on paper claims Antioch and Takia as its own but it's the least of its concerns right now when approaching which cities to include in this book I was sort of thinking about a few questions and one was which cities which cities showcased why cities decline, why cities fail, why some cities don't continue to thrive and to make comebacks from setbacks and so forth, and also what, what is a capital. In the modern day, there's quite good definitions of what a capital city is. It's generally the seat of government, just the most important city of each country. But in antiquity, we don't have solidified countries. And actually, what a capital is is much harder to define. And I looked at different definitions of what makes a capital city. And I tried to pick cities that, came, that spoke to different elements of what it is to be a capital. So Ravenna, of the cities that I cover, perhaps has the most obvious, straightforward claim to be a, a Mediterranean capital, because it stood as the capital of the Western Roman Empire for just shy of a century in the fifth century, following the fall of Rome and the fall of Milan. It became the power center, the political center of the Western Roman Empire. But the other cities here, I would argue, are equally important, or were at least in their heyday, and equally so as capitals, for different reasons. So Tyre, I chose because it's, for me, well, it's the start of the journey for me, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. But it's also really the start of extensive and systemized Mediterranean trade. Tyre was the great metropolis of the Phoenicians. It had a rivalrous relationship with the other Phoenician cities. And again, something I'll come to in a moment is who exactly were the Phoenicians and should we define them as a coherent civilization? But the, great, but the Phoenicians were the great traders of antiquity and Tyre 
was their main metropolis. And from Tyre, trade routes, ships left from Tyre made of the cedar wood from Mount Lebanon and fanned out across the Mediterranean. And not only did the Tyrians go abroad to trade, but they also settled. They weren't conquerors, but they built trading outposts around the Mediterranean. So many cities that people might have visited on holiday, so from Palermo in Sicily to Malaga in southern Spain to Tangier to many other places, have Phoenician roots that have been long forgotten, but that is the original origin of those cities and brought about these, the foundation of these cities that have still survived to the modern day. Carthage is perhaps the best and most well-known analogy of a city that was great, so great that it rivaled Rome and famously became within a hair's breadth, arguably, of, just, of stopping the Roman Empire in its tracks, stopping the expansion of Rome in the Second Punic War, and then declined. And it was thoroughly sacked by the Romans at the end of the Third Punic War. But what many people don't realize is that then there was an afterlife to that. Within, within one century of the Roman sack of Carthage, a new Roman colony was formed in Carthage. And it became an important early Christian center as well. And then it was taken by the Vandals. And it had a long afterlife following the Roman sacking. And this is often overlooked in broad studies of Carthage. Syracuse as a capital. Less claim, it was Syracuse was never the center of an expansive empire, but it's important as a Mediterranean capital for, for its position at the very center of the Mediterranean and as a crossing place between of, of empires and cultures. You know, it's a stepping stone between North Africa and Europe and also between East and West. And you really feel the imprint of these transitions and civilizations in Syracuse today. But also, it's a capital of ideas. It's a place where a lot of important thinking took place and a lot of important inventions. Syracuse was a city that was formative for Plato's philosophical writings and also for Archimedes' inventions, which are very famous and very current right now because they were the focus of the new Indiana Jones film, which has, you know, you know think of it what you like. I was happy to see Syracuse on screen, so that was good for me. <laughs> Ravenna, I've touched on, it has very good claim, very established claim to be called a capital. I don't need to justify that one to you. It was a capital. And then the last city we come to is Antioch, or as it's known in the modern day, Antakya. And Antioch was certainly a regional capital in the Roman Empire. It was the capital of Roman Syria. And in fact, when you think of the capitals of Syria, you have, long before Damascus was the, the important city, the, most, the foremost city of Syria, Antioch and Tyre jostled for preeminence in that region and to be considered Syrian capitals. But Antioch did very much surpass Tyre following the Bronze Age. Antioch was founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals and it went on to be the capital of the Seleucid Empire and then it transitioned into periods of, like under, well, transitioned into Roman rule and came under other empires and civilizations as well, passing through the Ottomans until eventually it's annexed by Turkey quite controversially with, with, with Hatay state in the 20th century. Anyway, so I want to take you on a bit of a journey now and talk to you about each of these cities in turn. And unfortunately, this is quite a hard book to talk about in a sort of 45 minute lecture because one, like even a one hour lecture is not enough to give you an overview of the history of each of these cities. So sort of the 10 minutes that I have for each one it's going to be quite glancing, but I'm going to do my best. And I'm going to start with Tyre. Tyre. Tyre is one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited. And it really is the start of this book journey for me. Because I actually came across these cities that, that bookend this book, bookend this book, Tyre and Antioch, when I was researching my first book, Queens of Jerusalem, which is about women during the Crusades, ruling women in the medieval Middle East. And I'm very hands-on with my research. I like to use my job as a historian as an excuse to travel to beautiful places. This was a big motivating factor in the idea of this book. And I, so I came to Tyre and Antioch, and sp specifically Tyre, in researching about the Crusades. And when I arrived in the city, I was struck by the layers of history that were so clearly visible all around me. I remember, you know, I got there after a long bus ride down from Tripoli, like very long, got off the bus, stumbled into sort of a beach bar for a, for a beer, which I didn't expect because I was told it was a very, I was, I was expecting it to be a very um, Islamic conservative city, which it is in places, but I, the first place I wandered into was the Christian quarter, which I didn't expect to find at all, and yeah, into a bar on the beach, and the table that I sat at was held up by two Byzantine columns that are just there. And then when you swim in the sea, yeah, you're tripping, when you wade out off from the beach, you're tripping over Byzantine and, Byzantine and Roman columns, and I, I cut my foot on something that turned out to be an amphora handle. So the, the history is everywhere, and 
for a multitude of reasons, not least the recent economic crisis and such, there just isn't enough, there isn't the same funding put into archaeological preservation and sort of cleaning everything and ticketing everything that you, of antiquity that you find in other Mediterranean cities. So really entire, I sort of f felt like I was stumbling upon sort of ruins and antiquity in a very raw state. There are two phenomenal archaeological sites which are very well curated and taken care of, but in, despite that, there's history everywhere you look and it's an incredible experience to be there. And the city, when it was originally founded, was founded as an island. It's now collected to the, connected to the mainland for reasons I will talk about shortly. But it's a stunningly beautiful place and it really inspired this book just for the many, the many layers of history that you could see everywhere. So this is a later engraving of Tyre in, from a later period. This is from the 18th, uh, this from the 19th century, this one. And you can see the city is more modest, but it's beginning to come back. And you can still see Ottoman and medieval buildings. Um, and yet the watchtowers in the sea, there are still traces of these, which is quite cool. And you know, when you're in Tyre, you see fishermen going out and sort of fishing from the ruins of Byzantine buildings and medieval towers. And it's, it's really, it's quite, you feel very in touch with the history. But so Tyre as a capital, it has particular resonance in it, the memory of Tyre because it's eulogized and rhapsodized over by ancient writers across many civilizations. So the first reference I came across of Tyre was actually when I was studying Herodotus and I found this description of Herodotus visiting Tyre basically as well, either a pilgrim or a tourist. I mean, there, there, there are similarities between the two. To see this amazing temple in Tyre, which he calls the Temple of Heracles, but is actually the Temple of Heracles, Mel Heracles Melkart, a Phoenician deity. And he writes, I made a voyage to Tyre in Phoenicia because I had heard there was a temple there of great sanctity dedicated to Heracles. I visited the temple and found that the offerings which adorned it were numerous and valuable, not the least remarkable being two pillars, one of pure gold, the other of emerald, which gleamed in the dark with a strange radiance. So Tyre was famed in Herodotus' day as having these very advanced and particularly wealthy temples. And that, that's, that's significant. It speaks to the wealth of Tyre. But how did Tyre become so wealthy? Well, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Phoenicians who founded Tyre. So Tyre is a Phoenician city, and who exactly the Phoenicians were is quite a complex question, and it's quite hard to identify. And in fact, the word Phoenician is quite unfashionable today in modern Lebanon, because actually a lot of, a lot of ancient histories we see with Roman stuff as well can be appropriated for modern political ideologies. And so now when you visit the National Museum of Beirut, the National Museum of Beirut, yeah, National Museum of Lebanon in Beirut, Many of the artifacts that I would consider to be Phoenician are simply labeled Bronze Age or Canaanite. So the Phoenicians are quite a mysterious civilization, but essentially they come from the intermingling of the even more mysterious Sea Peoples and the Canaanites in the Bronze Age Levant. And they develop as a distinct civilization of master mariners, master architects, master craftsmen, inventors, who are, who are famed throughout the ancient world for perfecting the arts of navigation, but also for their architectural skill and craftsmanship. So we have mentions in the Iliad, in, in Homer, in the Iliad, and the Odyssey, to gifts of like art, works of art, sort of Phoenician silver work being given as the prizes at the funeral games of Patroclus, or mantles of purple dyed cloth being given as gifts to kings and in, in tribute. So the, the, the fame of the Phoenician skill in, in inventing and weaving and dyeing travels far. The signature product of Tyre was the purple dye, which they extracted from Urex sea, sea snails and was incredibly valuable. And although it started off as the main trade of uh, Phoenician Tyre, Tyre was, colon was conquered and colonized multiple, no, not colonized, conquered multiple times down the centuries. And the purple trade remained strong all the way to the Byzantine period. One of the best preserved sarcophagi that you can see in Tyre today is a very beautiful sarcophagus belonging to Antipater the Murex fisherman. And it's, it's lavish, it's decorated with fish scales, it has like a Medusa head on the sides, and it has this inscription commemorating the trade of the man who would once have been buried in it. There are many sarcophagi in Tyre, but they've all been smashed open and everything stolen out of them. So they all have a hole in one end, and this is no exception. But it, and that speaks to the, the continuity and the power of the purple trade, because even in the Byzantine period, you know, thousands of years after this trade began, it's still the main industry of the city and someone who is working, I mean, he probably was a tycoon, not an actual fisherman, a uh, ty tycoon of Murex, is still one of the most wealthy and high status people in the city, but you can tell this from the sarcophagus. 
The Phoenicians, they had this very complex relationship with the other civilizations around the coast at this time. They had a, a relationship of exchange, but also paying tribute and capitulation to Egypt. So we see huge Egyptian influence in Phoenician art at this time. But they also had interesting relationships with the kings of Israel. They were obviously geographically very close. The most, perhaps the most, well, there are two very significant examples of Phoenician royalty mentioned in the Old Testament. One is of Jezebel, a Tyrian princess who marries and is the king of Israel and attempts to convert the Israelis to the Phoenician religion. And she, she, sets, she, uh, she sets up altars to Baal, the Phoenician god, throughout the kingdom of Israel and eventually is, meets a very sticky end, is defenestrated. And there's a very graphic depiction of her, of her death in the Old Testament, which is quite distressing, but also... It's, it's very interesting from a literary perspective, and I, it, well, I advise you all to go and read it, but you know, it describes her knowing her death is upon her and her putting on her traditional Phoenician regalia and her putting on her makeup, you know, painting her face, dressing her head and waiting for her death, and it's very, it's very powerful. The other very important relationship that we see between kings of Tyre and the kings of Israel is the relationship between King Hiram, who presided over Tyre during its golden age, and King Solomon in Israel. And they are meant to have had a very collaborative, friendly relationship where they'd send each other puzzles for each other to solve and sort of be in competition. But also, when, Hiram wanted, uh, when Solomon wanted to build the temple, his temple in Jerusalem, he asked to be sent Tyrian craftsmen and architects to build the temple. And Solomon's temple was made by Tyrian architects out of Lebanese cedarwood. And in return, they were given olive groves and other goods in exchange. So it's a relationship of exchange, but also one of war, as we see, and religious warfare, as we see with Jezebel. Let's have a look. This is a slide of one of the archaeological sites in Tyre, and I've put it in because I want, I think this gives an impression of the scale and the majesty of Tyre, which did inspire writers. As I've mentioned, it's written about by Herodotus, but also we also see mentions of it in the Aeneid by Virgil, who talks about the Tyrian towers and the inspiration for Carthage, which we'll come to later. And in this archaeological site, where you can see this white processional road leading out to the sea, you sort of get a sense of the grandeur of ancient Tyre and that it, it really would have been one of these beautiful, particularly visually striking cities in antiquity. And now this road sort of stops at the sea, but in ancient times it would have continued even further. The sea at the end of this road is known and by archaeologists as the submerged quarter, and there's much more of the city under the sea. And this is one of the particularly interesting things about visiting Tyre. You can just swim there. You can just swim with a snorkel, and you can swim down into the sand, and you can pull up artifacts. You have to put them back, of course. It would, you can't steal them, but it's still it's an amazing way to be in touch with the antiquity. One of the most important references to Tyre um, in, his, in historic documents is Ezekiel's prophecy slash curse of Tyre in the Old Testament, in which, which speaks to the, the wealth of Tyre and its position as a capital, because Ezekiel talks about Tyre as the archetypal wealthy city that is riddled with vanity and pomp and sacrilege, and he curses it, and he foresees Tyre's destruction. He likens it to a treasure ship careening towards wreckage, and he really emphasizes the beauty of this city. And the beauty of Tyre in its Phoenician heyday is something that we see described time and time again. Even the Anastasi papyrus of ancient Egypt describe it as a city in the sea, and we have these descriptions of the walls rising directly out of the sea. When Tyre is founded, it's an island off the coast of Lebanon. Um, and anyway, so Ezekiel curses the Tyre, and he predicts the siege. Well, he's writing contemporaneously, but he writes of the siege with Nebuch of Nebuchadnezzar, who does come to Tyre and besieges the city for 13 years. And although he's successful to a degree, it sort of results in an, un in an uneasy stalemate, which sort of tells you about the impregnability of Tyre. Part of what allowed it to preserve its Phoenician identity for so long, despite many other civilizations and conquerors coming through the Levant, was that it was harder to capture and had a more distinct individual identity because it was an island city. But it turns out that the siege that will really humble Tyre and change its identity over the long term will not be Nebuchadnezzar's siege, but Alexander's. And this is what I want to talk to you a bit about now. Alexander the Great came to Tyre as part of his conquest. We know he, we, I'm sure people have a, he doesn't need much introduction, but a great Macedonian general, king, warlord, who marched east from Macedonia and conquered all the way to northern Egypt. And he came to Tyre following his defeat of the Persian king Darius at the Battle of Issus, a region just south of Antioch. And then he swept down the Phoenician coast. And he managed to capture the other Phoenician cities 
of Sidon, Arwad, Byblos, Petrun, with relative ease. They capitulated without much of a fight. And then he came to Tyre, and he wanted to capture Tyre. And the Tyrians, they were worried about Alexander. They, as a people, they'd been conquered before, but their last great conqueror had been Cyrus the Great, and he had adopted a policy of allowing cities to retain their identities, their religions, and their independence, provided they paid lip service and were willing to give him use of their legendary fleet. Alexander wanted, he didn't adopt this policy, Alexander wanted proper domination of the cities and he didn't want them to retain sovereignty. So here he came into a bit of a clash with Tyre because Tyre very much wanted to retain sovereignty. It had a very strong identity. Its patron deity Melkart was still very important to them and Melkart in later centuries will become conflated with Heracles so it's a very important figure for them and their temple as noted by Herodotus is particularly important and sacred to them and they don't want the Macedonian civilization to enter and take control of the city. But they don't want to get tangling with Alexander. He's got an army of about 35,000 men. They don't have anything like this. The advantage they do have is they're an island and they want to play that to the best they can. They send peace envoys to Alexander, offering him a crown of gold and sort of honeyed, flattering words in the hope that this will allow him to, they'll, they'll come to some sort of compromise where, where they'll pay him lip service, but ultimately he'll march on and leave them alone. And then Alexander responds to this by saying, OK, this sounds good, but I want to make a sacrifice in your legendary temple of Heracles Melkart. And the Tyrians say no. Why do they say no? Because the only people allowed to make sacrifices in the temple of Melkart are the kings of Tyre. So allowing Alexander this honour is basically tantamount to sacrificing sovereignty. On top of this, they think it's basically a Trojan horse-style ploy to gain entry to the city. If they let him in to make the sacrifice in the temple... Are his soldiers going to come in with him? Is it going to be the, are they going to throw away their best advantage, which is their high walls and the defence given to them by the sea? So they say no. And they think, what's the worst he can do? But Alexander declares war. And at first, there is a sense of what's the worst he can do. He doesn't have a fleet. Tyre has an incredibly powerful fleet. And on top of that, they have trade routes. So they're, they're going in and out. And Alexander's way of conquering cities is generally to surround them, block off their trade routes, and to cause capitulation this way, or to meet them in pitched battle, you know, on an open battlefield. But he can't do either of these things with the Tyrians, because he can't block off access to them. They've got, they've got two harbours, one facing north, one facing south, one of the best fleets of antiquity, and they're in the sea. So what Alexander does is something that will change the, will change the identity and the geography of Tyre forever. He decides he's going to connect the island to the mainland, which, frankly, must have sounded a bit bonkers at the time, but he was dead set on this, and he's not someone who takes no to an for an answer. So he makes a rousing speech to his army, saying, we can't march on, because if we leave Tyre unconquered, we, you know, our enemies, the Persians, could make use of their fleet, they could attack Greece and Macedon while we're gone. So we have to capture Tyre before we can march on east. So we're going to set in and we're going to do this properly. And then his technique is on the mainland, just across from Tyre, is something called another settlement called Old Tyre, which is sort of acts as a supply centre for the city and sends them grain and whatever they need out by ships. They can capture that. So they start there, they capture it, and then they pull down the buildings of that city, and he commands his men to throw the stones into the sea and to construct a land bridge by literally filling in the, filling in the sea. And it's about half a mile, so it's, it's quite a big undertaking. And at first, it's not so difficult because they're out of range of Tyrian archers and the sea's quite shallow near the mainland. But as they get further out, it gets steadily more difficult, not least because the sea gets deeper, but because they come under heavy fire from the Tyrians, who, while at first might have sneered at the land bridge starting to be created, thinking they'll never get here, it starts getting uncomfortably close. And so then they start raining down fiery arrows, everything they can on the builders and Alexander is forced to construct a palisade wall and could bring in siege engines to allow him to attack the city. The Tyrians do everything they can to repel him and they're, they're reasonably successful. They send fire ships, or old horse transport ships, they fill them with oil and set it alight and, and they wait it, they wait the ship at one end at the, at the stern so the bow is lifting out of the water and then they put, set it full sail when the wind's in the right direction, and it rams onto the land bridge that Alexander's constructing, and it sets fire to everything there. It pulls down the siege towers, it burns the palisade walls. Alexander is a major setback, but recovers and keeps going. And at some point, as he's approaching, he also manages to secure the cooperation of the Sidonians, Tyre's neighbours, brothers, slash rivals just up the coast, who agree to lend him their fleet at this point. So he does succeed 
and with the help of this fleet, the completed land bridge, and also ships sent from Cyprus and Rhodes, he manages to complete his siege of Tyre and force the capitulation of the city. And it's particularly bloody. Uh, everyone who they've evac the Tyrians who have a close relationship with some of the daughter cities which they founded centuries before, such as Carthage, have evacuated the women, the children, the particularly vulnerable member of vulnerable members of the population, they've evacuated them to Carthage. But of all the men left within the city, anyone who wasn't sheltering in the Temple of Melkart is crucified by Alexander, and he crucifies thousands of people that day in Tyre, and he finally makes his sacrifice in the Temple of Heracles Melkart, secures the city, and marches on. But he doesn't live much longer than this. Alexander, despite being one of the great conquerors, the great rulers, one of the major figures of antiquity, dies at the age of 32. I think it's 32. Might be 33. I think it's 32. Not long after this siege. And the region falls to warring among his generals. The wars of succession of Alexander are a particularly interesting period of history, which I cannot go into now. And this, I think, I've got lots more I want to say about Tyre, but I've got carried away. So I'm going to move on to Carthage. Oh, here's a map, and you can see this is, this is, this is a bird's eye view of Tyre today. And Alexander's causeway was originally have been much narrower than this. It would have been, a, I can't remember exactly how many metres across, but much, much narrower than this. And perhaps the, the width of a boulevard, or of a major road, of a sort of four-lane road, not like this. Over time, the land bridge that Alexander built has silted up, and more land has come in, and it's just, it's, it's built up in this way. And ever since Alexander's siege, the island that was the ancient city of Tyre has been connected to the mainland of Lebanon and has been a peninsula. And this is a really a defining point in the changing of Tyre's identity because it never again had this, this reputation of impregnability. It was defeated in this very major, iconic way that was written about a lot in Chronicles. And also, fundamentally, its geography changed. It would never be the same and it would never be an isolated city again. Following the siege of, Alexan uh, following the siege of Alexander, Tyre begins to really decline. It's begun to decline after Nebuchadnezzar's siege, which is also a humbling moment, but really it declines in earnest after Alexander's conquest. And its, main, its most famous daughter city of Carthage begins to rise and surpass its mother city for importance. The foundation myth of Car Ooh, Tyre from the air, you can see Byzantine columns under the sea, very cool. This is a painting by Turner called Dido Building Carthage, and it's a visualization of the foundation myth of Carthage, which I'm not going to spend too much time on because I think it's one of the more familiar parts of my book. But essentially the story goes that Carthage was founded by a fugitive princess from Tyre known to the Tyrians in the Phoenician dialect as, well, Phoenician language as Alyssa, and who, event, and who later was given the name of Dido, which is a corruption of a Phoenician word meaning wanderer. She was, told, she was visited by her husband's ghost. Her husband died mysteriously. And her husband's ghost told her that her brother had assassinated him in an attempt to get his hands on his and Dido's treasure. And that he, the ghost also told her that she was not safe and she'd better run for it. So after various planning issues, etc., Dido does make a run for it. She takes a ship laden with gold and her supporters and she leaves the coast of Tyre and she sails for Carthage. And she stops in Cyprus on the way and she picks up a bunch of women to help her find the city, whether it's very unclear whether they were willing or coerced into coming on board the ship full of these Tyrian men. But they sail on and eventually they stop on the coast of North Africa. And the myth goes that she asks the local lords for some land to found a city. And they sort of laugh at her and say, OK, you can have as much land as you can cover with this ox hide. And they give her an ox, sorry, they give her an ox skin. And it's meant to be sort of a cruel joke. But instead, Dido stays up all night and she shreds it into a very long, thin, fine ribbon, which she lays around the base of a hill called Bursa Hill and says, I'll be having this, thank you. And apparently they're so impressed by her wit that they say, OK, yes, have the hill. I don't know how plausible that is, but it's a nice story. The Bursa Hill becomes the centre of Carthaginian civilization, And out from Bursa Hill where they build these incredible buildings on the top, the, the Temple of Eshmoon, the very sophisticated buildings using all the craftsmanship and expertise of the Tyrians they bring to Carthage and built, build a city that is fantastic. And it's really interesting to think what a traveller sailing into Carthage in the early days of its foundation would have seen. They'd have seen a city under construction, but they would have also seen the beginnings of one of the most beautiful cities of antiquity, Carthage had two harbours, one of which was circular. You can still see the remains of this harbour today. It's quite marshy, but you can still visit it. And then the circular harbour leads to another. 
and one is used for shipbuilding, one is used for sailing out from. But they were these, they were monumental and they were very sophisticated. And then the centre of the city, the spiritual heart, is the temple complex on top of Bursa Hill, which is the Temple of Eshmoon, among other religious buildings, and was really was really seen to be very beautiful. But unfortunately, nothing is left of this because of the Roman sacking of the city. One of the very few archaeological sites that remain from the Phoenician period, the early foundation years of Tyre, is the Tophis of Carthage, which you can see here. And it looks a bit like, a, I mean, it sounds really awful. To me, I think it looks a bit like a pet cemetery. But it's, it's you know, it's in fact something much, much more sinister. Um, well, maybe sinister is not the right word. I'll leave that to you. For you to reflect on but this is a site well it's I mean it's a site of child sacrifice that's my interpretation of the evidence because and it's called the Tophet of Carthage the word Tophet comes from the Old Testament and is known to be as a word used for sites of child sacrifice and this site was discovered by two French archaeologists who were in Tunisia in the 20th century and were confused when they met this antiquities dealer who seemed to have this endless supply of Punic era Carthaginian stelae, uh, these carved, these interesting carved sort of head, headstone-esque carvings, pieces of rock. And they followed him one night and sort of laid a stake out and they found him digging in this for long forgotten suburb of Tunis. And what they found was the Tophet of Carthage, this major collection, this, this is just, the image you see here is just one part of it, this major expansive collection of these tombstone-esque carvings and what these carvings came with, what's what accompanies them, are clay urns, which inside contain sort of calcified, burned, charred remains of very, very young children, very, very young, so sort of newborn infants, that sort of, uh, that sort of age group, often alongside animal bones. And for a long time, this was interpreted to maybe be... It's, uh, people didn't want to attribute to child sacrifice. It's a very, it's a sort of slanderous accusation to a civilization, or at least some people think so. They didn't want to attribute this to child sacrifice. There were theories going around that this is a specific cemetery for babies who are born prematurely or miscarried or who don't survive infancy. But we do have a lot of textual evidence to support the practice of child sacrifice by the, by the Carthaginians. And what's particularly interesting is it's a, the presence of the Tophet is a major distinction between early Phoenician settlements in the eastern Mediterranean on the Levantine coast and western Phoenician settlements in the western Mediterranean. So Tophets have been found in other Phoenician trading outpost cities, so in Spain and in North Africa, but none have been found in Tyre. And the leading scholar of the moment has suggested that maybe this is part of a reason of the breaking of ties between Carthage and Tyre, the decline of the relationship between these cities, and also maybe was, a a, was maybe a reason that people did leave Tyre. Maybe it was a, a religious difference over whether or not this practice should be continued. We have references to potential child sacrifice in textual evidence for the Levant and for the Kingdom of Israel. The Old Testament, not the least, which contains many references to child sacrifice by the kings of Israel. Uh, but it's always, it's always discouraged. It's, whenever child sacrifice is mentioned in the Old Testament, it's always condemned. So you know, the most famous instance is Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, where he takes his longed-for son and is preparing to sacrifice him on God's command, and then is reprieved at the last minute and the sacrifice doesn't take place. And there are various other mentions. So it's not an alien concept of child sacrifice in the Bronze Age of Levant, either for the Phoenicians or the Canaanites or in the Kingdom of Israel. And in the interesting, in, interestingly, in the sources that describe Alexander's siege of Tyre, there's, a men there's mentions of a council meeting where some members of the council said, how about we do some child sacrifice to get things going and going our way? But once again, that, that proposal is rejected and benched by the majority. So there's definitely mentions, traces of child sacrifice in Tyre, but we have no evidence of it on the scale that we have in Carthage. The most searing and sort of unpleasant description of child sacrifice in Carthage comes from Diodorus Siculus, who's a very negative source. And what we have to remember when we consider later Roman and Greek textual evidence about Carthage is this is perhaps history's best example of history being written by the winners. Carthage was destroyed by the Romans. The Carthaginians were very unpopular in Sicily because the, king, uh, the tyrants of Sicily, and particularly Syracuse, were constantly at war with Carthaginians for control of the island. So 
the pe you know, Diodorus Siculus, a Sicilian Roman sympathetic writer, is not a friend of Carthage, but he writes, they also allege that Cronos, Baal, had turned against them inasmuch as in former times they had been accustomed to sacrifice to this god the noblest of their sons, but more recently they had been secretly buying children and sent these to sacrifice. So this is a point where one of the tyrants of Syracuse is attacking Carthage on home soil. Agathocles of Syracuse has not only driven the Carthaginians from Sicily, but has invaded North Africa itself and is trying to march on Carthage. So this is, a, this is in a sense, a situation in extremis, where they're beginning to consider, where they really feel they have to regain the gods' favor, much as the Tyrians might have considered child sacrifice when Alexander is bashing on their gates. And what this source attests is that, okay, the Carthaginians had always been in the habit of sacrificing a certain number of children a year to the god Baal, but re and it was always the noble-born children, it was always children of high-ranking aristocratic families. But in recent years, they'd got complacent with this and had been buying children from slave women, from impoverished people, and sacrificing these babies instead of their own, which had apparently displeased the god. So, in their zeal to make amends for the submission, they selected 200 of the noblest children and sacrificed them publicly. Um, and the, the way that he describes the sacrifice is horrible. It describes going to the Tophet, to a statue of the god who had his sort of arms raised like this. And they'd put the infants in the arms of the statue, which would then roll down into a fire pit. And it's all, it's, it's, they're horrible descriptions. This may or may not be the method of, that was employed, but we have numerous textual references to the practice of child sacrifice in Carthage, and the Tophet is perhaps the most clear evidence that this did indeed take place. But it is a subject to debate, and it can't be definitively proven, but all the evidence certainly points that way. Then we come to the Punic Wars, which, which is perhaps what Carthage is most famous for, and I'm not going to talk too much about because it's one of the best known areas of Carthaginian history. And I've got to rush, I'm completely running out of time, so I'm going to rush a bit. In my book, I, try, I do give details of the Punic Wars, but what I try to do differently is I try to focus more on the periods between the wars, because my focus is not on the Carthaginian Empire, my focus sadly is not just on Hannibal, who's amazing, amazing historical figure, but on the city of Carthage. So I focus on the city and the impact these wars have on it. And I think one of the most interesting episodes in this period of the, of the Punic Wars is the Truceless War, the mercenaries war that occurs in between the First and Second Punic Wars after the loss of Sicily. Essentially what happens is that the First Punic War is lost at sea. It's full of sea battles and Carthage is defeated at sea. Their land armies who are stationed on Sicily and are primarily made, of merc made up of mercenaries are successful in that they are never defeated. But when Carthage capitulates to Rome at the end of the First Punic War, they have, to re they have to summon these armies back. They have to say to abandon their posts because one of the main takeaways of the First Punic War is Carthage is forced to withdraw from Sicily. But then they have a real problem on their hands because the mercenaries leave, Carth leave Sicily and come back to Carthage and they've been at war, some of them for 20 years, and they want to be paid. They're owed an awful lot for the time they spent away and particularly because they were undefeated. If they'd been defeated, it might have been easier for Carthage to not pay them, A, because they'd all be dead, or B, because the survivors, you could say, well, you didn't do your job properly, so we don't have to pay you. But this leads to one of the greatest threats to Carthaginian, uh, the greatest ex existential threats that Carthage ever experiences, because this, this mercenary army turns on them at a point where they're crippled by their war debt to Rome. The Treaty of Versailles style impose reparations, war guilt on the Carthaginians, force them to disband their navy, and pay Rome's war expenses. So at this time, when their economy is buckling, also after 20 years of war, they're now expected to find a mammoth salary for this huge army, and they can't, and the army t attacks them, and it becomes the most bloody conflict in, I mean, one of the most horrible, merciless conflicts in history. Anyway, we'll move on. I can't talk more about Carthage, alas, and in fact, I'm also going to pass over Sicily, sadly. Syracuse is amazing. I'll talk a bit about Syracuse. I can't not. So Syracuse is the glue that holds the book together and is also one of the most important cities for understanding Mediterranean history. And a big part of that can be seen in this building. This is the Duomo of Syracuse, and it's one of my favorite buildings in the world. And the reason for this is that it's a Christian cathedral that has morphed out of a temple of Athena 
that was built by the original Corinthian Greek settlers. And I'm going to move to the next slide a bit so you can see. But essentially, we have the ancient Greek columns of the cathedral in the side of the building. You can, if you look along the, the far side of it, you can see the, the shape of Doric columns emerging from the stone. And these are the original Doric columns built by the Corinthians. And you can see that this is the inside of the cathedral. You can see them inside as well. So this building, the Duomo of Syracuse, is almost like it's a living palimpsest of the many civilizations that have come through Sicily. This building, originally a Greek temple to Athena, it to Athena, it faced the other way. So originally it was built to face the sun, whereas when it became a Christian cathedral, it was reversed and the facade put on the what had previously been the back. But also, but they, what's fascinating about it is it's preserved the architecture of the original temple and it's stayed as a functional place of worship through all these millennia. And it was also converted to a mosque briefly during the period of the Islamic conquests. The question of Syrac Syracuse, oh, I wish I could talk more about it. I mean, Syracuse as a place of ideas is so important, not only for these transitions of religion that we see between the pagan religion to Christianity, to Islam, back to Christianity, but also for, I th you know, I think one of the most interesting chapters in Syracuse's history is when Plato comes to Syracuse. Plato meets Dion, the nephew of the tyrant Dionysius I of Syracuse, while he's away in mainland Greece studying. And they strike up a friendship. Dion is so anxious, so intrigued, so interested in Plato's teachings that he you know, makes himself his pupil and invites Plato back to Syracuse to meet his uncle. And Plato would have a very mixed relationship with Syracuse because Plato is an Athenian. And Syracuse was behind, was the city that was behind Athens' perhaps most greatest grueling defeat, which was the destruction of the Athenian expedition during the Peloponnesian War. And Plato grew up in, during the Peloponnesian Wars and the Syracusan defeat of Athens was one of the major, was one of the defining events in Athenian history which led to the decline of Athens and there's a Mediterranean power and laid the, laid, laid the stage for the rise of Rome and well, Sparta instead. But Plato came with Dion to Syracuse and the reason for that is he was anxious to put his theories of a philosopher king into practice. He saw the chance to work with a ruling tyrant as a chance to put his philosophical theories into practice. So he stayed a long time in Syracuse trying to influence Dion Dionysius and then later came back to teach Dionysius II. And he was all, it's also been thought that his time in Syracuse may have inspired his, theory, his analogy of the cave because Syracuse, as I've mentioned, it defeated Athens and it defeated the Athenian expedition. It was a major naval victory for Syracuse where they completely routed the Athenian, the Athenian fleet and took many prisoners of war. And they kept them in the Latome, the, the quarries and caves of Syracuse, which essentially became proto-concentration camps. You had thousands of men kept here together, some of them in the open air, some of them in the caves. And the most high and the, and the most important prisoners were kept in this cave, which has become known as the Ear of Dionysius, for two reasons. One, it echoes. So the theory is, is you can hear, if there are people scheming in the back of the cave, you can hear them at the front but also because the inside structure sort of resembles an ear canal. But the men who are held in this cave, it, as I said, it, the, the internal structure resembles an ear canal, so it sort of curves. And the men who are held in this cave were kept in darkness, and all they could see was the shadows of their captors, of the guards, on the wall. So and this was a theory that it inspired the teaching, the, the analogy of the cave, so a very important influence on Western philosophy. The other great inventor, thinker to come out of Syracuse is Archimedes, and he's of Indiana Jones fame, but you know, price that also well known. Um, he invented many. You know, he had the eureka moment in which he worked out how to work out volume through displacement of water, and I won't go into these well-known stories, but was also famed, and it also made very practical inventions and solutions, which are still used in engineering today the hydraulic screw, which I don't have a picture of, and it's quite would be quite a boring picture. It was a major advance for, for engineering. But he's most famous for his creation of these crazy siege machines used to defend Syracuse against the Roman siege. But these included the heat ray of Archimedes, which in theory, sort of like children with, uh, children with magnifying glass using the sun to burn ants. It was a series of mirrors and lenses, which in theory, harnessed the power of the sun and used it to burn ships in the water. And he also had this great claw, which sort of like a grappling hook, sort of like, you know, those machines in arcades where you can pick a soft toy up and drop it in the thing if you have the right skill. He did, made one of these for ships, which could lift them out of the water, smash them and drop them. 
there's not a lot of accurate historical evidence for this, but um, and I think the I think the claw is more believable than the heat heat ray, as well as the, the sort of major the sort of the catapults he invented. And the other major invention is this great ship called the Syracoisia, which was the biggest ship ever created in antiquity. You sort of think the sort of Titanic of its day only better, but the only problem was it was such a large ship that there were only two harbours in the whole Mediterranean that could accommodate it. One was Syracuse and the other was Alexandria. And it went on its maiden voyage from Syracuse to Alexandria and was meant to go back to Syracuse, only the king of Alexandria liked it so much that he just hoiked it out of the water and kept it as a palace on land and it never got to go back. So not the best investment of resources on the parts of the tyrants of Syracuse. How are we doing for time? I'm going to have, well, no, I can't skip Ravenna. Um, I cannot, especially when I have this beautiful display behind me, I cannot not talk about the mosaics of Ravenna. So I'm going to talk very, very briefly about them. The thing about when you visit Ravenna is it could be any northern Italian city when you walk into it. It's sort of neat, red brick, loads of gelaterias, places selling like artisan prosciutto. It's really nice. But you would never realise from the outside that this is such an important city for antiquity and for studying transitions in the Mediterranean, but it is. And when you realise this, is when you enter these red brick buildings and see these glittering interiors, um, which testify to the importance of it. And these are, despite it being northern Italy, these mosaics are without doubt the best preserved, the best examples of Byzantine Christian art, um, more so than anything we see in, Constantin in, in Istanbul, Constantinople, or indeed, and you know, you might think that some of the best mosaics you've seen are in Palermo, but those are built sort of, those, I mean, 700 years later, these are from the fifth century. And they're still some of the most amazing interiors I've seen anywhere, forget the age, they're stunning. This is the mausoleum of Gallup City, who I don't have time to talk about, which is very sad, but it's my favorite building in Ravenna. But these are perhaps the even more well, more better well-known mosaics of Ravenna. These are the imperial portraits of Theodora. Here's the Empress Theodora with her girl squad in all her imperial regalia. And she stands opposite her husband, Justinian, who is the famous Byzantine emperor reigning in the sixth century, which is a period of crisis, catastrophe, and resurgence for the Byzantine em empire. These mosaics were built in 540 to commemorate Belisarius's recapture of Ravenna. And they build these beautiful mosaic portraits of the emperor and empress. And I'd love to talk more about their reigns, but there just isn't time. But the year, the year 540 is a very important year for the Byzantine Empire, not only because they recapture northern Italy through the work of the general Belisarius, who's standing next to Justinian, but also because it's the year they lose Antioch. And this brings us to the last city, which I am going to talk about for about three minutes, but which is a shame because it's, it's my favorite of these cities, but for very sad reasons. So Antioch was founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals, Seleucus Nicator, in the aftermath of the Alexander's conquests. And it existed as the capital of the Seleucid Empire, but then also as an important Roman city. And it was, it was a major metropolis of the East, and it was a place where Roman Empire spent a lot of, Roman Empire spent a lot of time. But it's garnered much more attention in recent, in the last year, than it, would, than it has perhaps in the last three centuries combined. And that's because of the earthquakes of February 6th, which were tragic in the scale of loss of human life, but also in the destruction of antiquity. Upwards of 50,000 people died across the region. Um, and and the, the city of Antakya was completely leveled. And I, I live in Beirut. I woke up about three in the morning because I have a German shepherd and he was barking his head off. And there was some banging in my house and th books had fallen off the shelves and that sort of thing. But I didn't really realize what it was. I'd been asleep. And I woke up in the morning and I saw these news reports coming through of the earthquakes in Antakya. And at first, the scale of the tragedy wasn't clear. You know, the first day the death toll goes from like 200 people confirmed, 500. But then it's jumping up by the thousands. And at first, Antakya is not in the news cycle at all. Partly because Hatay, Hatay State is sort of a slightly tricky bit of Turkey that's ruled by, it's, it's, got, it's got a strong support of the opposition. So generally, politically, they get the short end of the stick in terms of aid. But also... We didn't hear about Antakya because, not because it wasn't badly affected, but because it was perhaps the worst affected city. And so the communication wasn't coming out of it clearly. And also it wasn't at the epicenter, but it still was the worst affected. This is not surprising. Antakya has a history of earthquakes that are very well documented. It's situated over sort of a triple tectonic plate boundary. Um, and we have accounts from you know, uh, the year 115, where the Emperor Trajan is in Antioch when an earthquake strikes and he has to escape out the window. 
And then we also have very moving accounts from the 6th century, the year I've just meant, uh, just before, ju in Justinian's rule, the year 526, when there's a major earthquake that right, wipes out almost the entire city. Um, and it's, we have descriptions of the earthquakes from John Malalas. I'll talk about these. Oh, it's not working. No. I'll talk about these sites in a second. We won't read the descriptions. We don't have time. But anyway, these take us to the modern day. These are the results of the modern day earthquake. So my book was actually going to press in February. Um, and I had to hoik it back from the publishers and get a bit more time because there was no way I could publish a book about Antakya and not cover the most significant event of the last four centuries in the history of the city. So I had to get it back. And then I waited about two weeks after the earthquakes and then I went to Antakya because in all the reports that were coming out, we weren't getting reports of the damage to monuments. And my book would simply have been factually incorrect because I write a lot about the modern city and the interfaith communities and very, various different aspects and a lot about the few buildings that have survived from antiquity, because not many have because of all these earthquakes, but there were a few, which I had in previous slides. And I needed to see if they were still standing, because my book originally said the city of Antakya is this, is that, it has this building, it has that building. I write a lot about the Greek Orthodox Church, um, which I went to masses in, I saw a wedding in, I wrote, you know, described it, but it's not standing anymore. Um, and various other ones, I wrote a lot about the hammams of Antakya that survived from the Ottoman period, and again, they're gone. But miraculously, I will go back if I can. If I can. But miraculously, two, my two favorite sites of Antakya did survive against, completely against the odds. One is the cave church of St. Peter. So Antioch was a very important city for early Christianity. It was the place where the Christian communities first identified as Christians by that word. And it was a, pla a very important place for early preaching and conversion. And because Christianity was not supported or recognized by the Roman Empire, the early Christians took to preaching and meeting in caves outside the city. And this is one of the, this on the left, right hand side, right hand side, this is an interior of a, a cave church, which according to local tradition, St. Peter preached in, St. Paul was also in Antioch. Also, it's also attributed to John. The, the, the exact history of it is hard to come by, but it is certainly a place of worship that goes back to the very earliest Christian times. And because it's built into the side of the mountain, just outside the city, it was preserved. And it was the first building I was able to visit when I reached Antakya, because actually when I got there, the, there were no roads because all the buildings collapsed into the road. So you can't drive around the city. It's not easy to climb in and to explore it. But outside, there's fewer buildings. So it's the first building I went to, and it was incredibly moving because I went in and it was it was in perfect condition. There wasn't a scratch on it. Everything else in the city was gone, but this building was still standing. It was very moving. And additionally, this big portrait shot is of the Iron Gate of Antioch. And this is the last standing remains of the walls of ancient Antioch, which was sort of described as akin to the walls of Troy. Um, and this is the last piece that stands, and it still stands, but the rest of the city is very much destroyed. And while I was there, there was another earthquake. Um, and that was, I mean, a horrifying experience because the building I was in collapsed and all this stuff. But it really did make me feel like I was in dialogue or I, under, you know, I had this connection with the ancient historians because the, they describe the earthquake, the feelings of the earthquake so accurately. It's like thunder but coming from the ground. And the descriptions that you have from the ancient writers, if you can scan these quickly now, are very, very similar to the descriptions that you have by modern journalists coming, uh, detailing the earthquakes of today. Anyway, so Antioch... That earthquake was just one of the most tragic. It was one of the most difficult things to write about and research. And I had to go back through the book and change a lot of present tense stuff to past tense stuff. And people I interviewed sadly were killed. And but from the point of view of a historian, it was it was also it was very powerful because this whole book was sort of inspired by thinking about the life cycle of cities and the cyclical nature of history. And yeah, so experiencing this firsthand it really hammered that home and it really brought out that actually there are many reasons why cities contract, fail, fall out of power and prominence, but the, the, the overarching one is natural disaster. And that's something we're coming up against more and more in the modern day as we do have the effects of climate change. I mean, I was in Sicily the last two summers, summer before last in Syracuse, we hit 52 degrees. It was the highest temperature recorded on record for that region. This summer it was something like 42 and we were all melting when I had my book launch. Um, Ravenna earlier this year was subject to terrible floods, the whole region around Ravenna. So, yeah, and then of course Antioch has been destroyed yet again. So, anyway, this was 
It's a very powerful, moving experience. I will stop there. I've really gone over. We have three minutes for questions. I hope that's enough. <laughs> So yeah, um, we do have three minutes. I'm sure we can extend it to five or seven. Um, are there any questions? Oh yes, gentlemen there. Is there a microphone? Raising yep. microphone. Sorry. Uh, so I was at two other talks previous to this one, uh, one on Rockabill mm -hmm. and one on uh, the Dockey Island uh, Marino at Dockey. And in both of them, I had a Eureka moment. Okay. <laughs> the Eureka moment was our rock pool, which is between Dublin and Wales. Uh, we call it, well, I'm calling it a rock pool with the salmon in the rock pool. F about... 8,000 years ago, mm -hmm. it was 10 meters lower. And everything was land out to Rockabilly, an island, basically speaking, uh, if you take a, a bit of a poetic license. Mm -hmm. And then, today, you've given me a Plato moment <laughs> in that Plato was in Syracuse to try and get him to drop the Pythagorean theory of the cosmos so he could make his geocentric theory of the cosmos. But instead of being a rock pool that he was in, he's in a swimming pool. Indeed. Like uh -huh. you were in swimming. And what I want to find out from you now is, if I go back 10,000 years now, mm -hmm. entire, not on the Alexandrian side, but on the other where you were swimming, how far out could you go? And would it be kilometers way out there where all Tyre the island is, and the whole Mediterranean, where you could find the city of Carthage and thing six kilometres underwater, maybe, and all the all the all the tribes that were in that from the mm -hmm. Mediterranean times, right from the time of Tyre, wherever you say it began. Well, 10,000 years ago, there wouldn't have been much there in terms of ancient cities because they all sort of came. Tyre was founded in sort of 2750 BC, but you'd have certainly had the island there. It's perfectly possible it would have been much bigger, um, but it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't, I, I couldn't tell you what the prehistoric geography, I'm really sorry to say, <laughs> but. Mm -hmm. Sorry <laughs> for that. Uh, this question. Uh, I just recall seeing the film uh, The English Patient where mm -hmm. uh, Herodias uh, was actually central to the narrative. Of Love this film, yeah. <laughs> uh, but w w I was, over the years I did come across some uh, reference to, uh, there was a lost city uh, that it was based on in Libya that they w made reference to. Uh, it was a king that actually uh, built a city in the, I think it was the Libyan desert uh, uh, close to Egypt and they, there was actually a Hungarian uh, count who actually went in search of this lost city and uh, I'm trying try to remember the name, K Kisambas, or I can't remember the, quite the name at the moment but is there many uh, investigations of lost cities in the uh, Obviously, the, the regions of North Africa where there's considerable amount of activity were from classical cultures in the Mediterranean, or do the, do the actual governments, uh, you know, in Tunisia, Morocco, right across Egypt, have an appreciation of that, or are these just lost cities that nobody cares about anymore? It's a great question, and it comes and goes, it comes and goes in waves, the interest in these places. I mean, Absolutely, there's a huge amount of interest and archaeological excavation. So my professor at UCL, a woman called Corison Fennec, is always out doing new excavations in North Africa. And there are frequently ones, but of course in Libya at the moment, the political situation is such 
but it's very hard to sort of mount completely new excavations and it's more about preserving the heritage that has already been uncovered. Likewise, in Lebanon, there's, there are ongoing archaeological excavations, but they are hampered by the political situation, the economic situation. But in the countries that are more stable and secure, I mean, Morocco's recently had an earthquake, but there are, there's, met, there's a lot of archaeological activity in Morocco and in Tunisia, indeed. There's many t cities discovered and being excavated across Tunisia, but in Libya, it's more complicated, the same in Lebanon. Thank you. Do you have any theories about the origins of the Phoenicians and the Sea Peoples? Like, it seems to be incredibly it's mysterious. It is, it's mysterious, and it's, 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 it's interesting because the Phoenicians who are credited with sort of developing the origins of our alphabet, they left ver very few written sources. So we have epigraphy, sort of stone inscriptions, and we have dedicatory inscriptions, and we have the archaeological record. But they, no, there was no Phoenician who sat down and wrote the history of the Phoenicians, which is very frustrating, because they really should have. They were good writers, and, and if they did write it, it was on very flimsy papyrus that's disappeared. And because they were traders, not conquerors, they didn't force other civilizations to write out their work and put it in their libraries. So. And then perhaps we might have had more material on the early Phoenicians had the libraries of Carthage not been so burned and disbanded. So it's really hard to say, do I have theories about when they came from? I mean, there's certainly Mediterranean coastal civilizations, the Sea Peoples, who dis and the Sea Peoples basically disrupted, caused a lot of disruption in ancient Egypt, and then and took over a lot of their territories in the Levant. And, but I couldn't, I couldn't say where they came from, but they, they're certainly a coastal civilization in the, in the Bronze Age Levant, but where exactly, I don't, I, we just don't have the sources. And there's a big question. The word sea peoples is just like X in algebra or a question mark. It's like, we know there was a big invasive force, but we don't know exactly who or why. Uh, anyone? Uh, do you have any explanation for the ludicrous degree of preservation of the churches in Ravenna compared to all the other contemporary buildings you're showing us? Yes, I do. Kind of box fresh. <laughs> it's politics. Um, Italy, uh, it's hard to say, and I, don't want, I would love to be employed by UNESCO at some point, so I'm not going to criticize them too much, but it comes down to conflict zones and where the money is, and there's a lot invested in preserving Italian heritage. Obviously, Italy, it capitalizes on its heritage as to bring in tourism. So these churches bring huge streams of revenue. These buildings bring huge streams of revenue. And I have to say, the preservation of the, these, these mosaics are something special. They absolutely should have priority. This, these, the buildings in Ravenna are incredible. Um, for Antioch, for Antakya, they're just not visually stunning. I mean, to me, I think the buildings of Antakya are so much, are just as impressive as the buildings of Ravenna. But I do understand if you're trying to quantify the historic value of a site, the cave church would not score as highly as these, these, these churches with all this mosaic art inside. And also in terms of when you're curating, you're pre historical preservation is both a matter of public record and preserving our history for future generations, but it's also about serving a community, serving people. And so in regions that just receive much fewer visitors, and also we, what we have to remember is that because of the transitions of the civilizations, the churches in Turkey are just not that important to the local populations because we don't, there aren't huge Christian communities in Turkey. They've been, for various reasons, I'm part Armenian, but, but you know, there aren't huge Christian communities in Turkey anymore. And so in terms of preserving buildings that are important to the local community, the churches are not at the forefront, but the Ottoman mosques and the hammams were very well preserved. So it comes down to priorities of local governments and UNESCO. Yeah. The first thousand, sorry, which? Oh, how do they get through the first thousand years? Well, well, they, they, in, in Antioch they haven't because of the earthquakes. We've got very, very few. Even before this earthquake, there's very little. So of the ancient walls of Antioch, they just haven't survived. They've just been torn down by earthquakes and conquerors over the years. In Ravenna, I guess they're inside the city. And because Ravenna declined in importance, we didn't have sort of invading armies like sacking these churches and such. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, there's been vandalism in the churches of Ravenna in the terms of iconoclasm and other 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 regimes. So when the when the vandals came, when the Goths have came, they've redone they've redone the mosaics in their own style in some places, but some are preserved. So there's there's differences. 
Um, I was wondering, during your, your stay in Sicily, did you go in search of the Aureolo Towers and the city walls that the Athenians built? Do you know they still Oh, standing? the Epipoli. Like, so, do you mean outside Syracuse? Do you mean yes, the castle of Yes, I think it's six kilometres outside. It's where they actually lost the battle in 412, I think. Yeah, so I mean, I did, I did look, so the main, the main sort of military fortifications outside that I went to was the castle of Euryalus and the surrounding fortific fortifications, which is so cool. Um, and I was chased by some bats in one of the tunnels, which was one of the most horrible, one of the worst experiences of, of my life. I have an ongoing phobia of bats, but, but yeah. There are remains of these walls, but they're very, less sort of in the state that you have entire. They're not necessarily ticketed and preserved. And when I was doing my research in Sicily, it was during COVID, so there hadn't been a gardener on any of these archaeological sites in about a year. So, but there's, you can still see the remains of these fortifications. Anyone else? Any last questions? No. Well, thank you so much. Um, the overwhelming thing that I wanted with this book was to encourage people to see the Mediterranean Sea, both then and now, as a point of connection between different civilizations and cultures and to draw attention to the shared cultural heritage of all these different cities around both east, west, north and south and to, yeah, to try and invert the idea of the Mediterranean as something divisive and instead see it as something connection, sorry, of something, a point of connection and exchange. Anyway, thank you so much for listening, for coming. <laughs>